Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. We'll give a few minutes to let people file into the, the lecture. If you're just joining us, we're just given a few minutes to let people come on into the, the lecture and we'll get started here shortly. For those just joining us, we're going to wait about one more minute to let people file in. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Kim Calderhouse. I'm the executive director of the Leelana Historical Society. If you're new to our organization, we're a museum and research facility located in Leland, Michigan. Currently we're open Wednesday through Friday from 11 to four and we'll expand those hours come summer. Um, behind the scenes, I've got Emma Keaton, our archivist, who's troubleshooting any tech issues. If you um, have can't hear anything or have a question, um, please put that in the chat. Otherwise, any questions for Michael during his pre presentation, you can put that in the Q&A. Um, thank you all for joining us. If you enjoy programs um, like this and the other ones that we offer throughout the year, please consider becoming a member if you aren't already one. I see a number of members um, in our attendee list tonight, so thank you for being a member. Um, but if you're not already, our membership um, starts at $25 and it supports programming like this and um, the wonderful exhibits you see at the museum and the research and archiving that goes on in the archives. Well, thank you all, and thank you to Michael Nagel for joining us today. I'll give you a little background. Um, Michael began researching, we were just chatting probably about five years ago, and reached out to the Lilana Historical Society and said, I'm, you know, researching Ever Ward. He uh, owned the Leland Iron Company at one time, and um, we provided some archival material. And I said, when, when you're done with this book, please get in touch with us. We'd love to have you do a lecture for us. Um, and so here we are in 2023 tonight um, is the culmination of that. So we're so thankful. And uh, Michael is a professor of history and political science at West Shore Community College and has now brought to light this wonderful story of Eber Ward. Thank you so much, Michael, for being here. Uh, and I will pass it off. We'll, Michael will get his slides up and we'll make sure that looks okay for everyone. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. the invitation, uh, as well as just, you know, the, the time that I had researching was great. And so it was really helpful. And so um, can you just let me know? I, I'm not seeing, uh, can you see that okay? Uh, I'm not seeing anyone else's um, uh, faces or anything like that. But if you could just let me know. Uh, I'm not seeing your presentation yet. Michael. You're not. Okay. All right. So let me try something here. It always uh, seems as if, okay, um, now are you seeing it? No. No. Well, that's excellent, isn't it? All right. So I'm going to go like this and try this. How about now? No. Oh, this is not good. We and it and everything worked just fine before. Yeah. It, it does seem a little bit different. Um uh oh, I know. I know why. Whoops. There we go. Okay. And so here we are. Okay. Are we good? 
We are. Thank you. I'm so sorry. That was completely my fault. You know what happened is I forgot to share my screen. I just I just started to uh, uh, to do the presentation. Anyway, well, thank you so much uh, for the invitation and for everyone who's um, online right now. Uh, I, I just really appreciate it. I teach at a community college, and in theory, uh, the students are are there because they want to be there. Uh, but really, um, they're kind of required to be there in many ways. So, for those of you who are online right now, uh, I just really appreciate uh, your your presence. And um, um, at the end of the presentation, if people have questions or comments or things that you'd like to raise, I'd, I'd be happy to try to address any of those. Um, so, I guess I'll just go ahead and start. Now, on the left-hand side of this slide, we see a portrait of Eber Ward. Uh, this was painted for his 60th birthday by and, and commissioned by his sister. And it really kind of demonstrates Ward at the apex of his power. When Eber Ward died, shortly, you know, just a couple of years after this was painted, when he died, he was the wealthiest man in Michigan. And this painting um, embodies a lot of the industries that he was involved with. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see my cursor or not. I think maybe you can, but it shows Eber Ward at a wharf, and he was involved in a lot of shipping, shipbuilding, and that, and so there's really a lot of maritime issues. There is a an anchor right here at his feet. There's also a, a compass um, and then just to the side, there's a globe demonstrating how worldly he was. Uh, other things in the foreground uh, demonstrate some, some sailing vessels, uh, some steamboats, as well as a lighthouse. Um, and so just as Eber Ward dominates the canvas of this painting, um, he dominated politics um, and I should say the economy. He dominated the economy in Michigan, uh, really from the 1850s until his death in 1875. And when I saw this painting, I, I just knew that it had to be on uh, the cover of the book. And so I was really fortunate that the Detroit Historical Society allowed me uh, to use that. So I really appreciate it. Well, on the right here, we see a couple of quotes uh, dealing with um, or uh, observations of, of Eber Brock Ward. One person described him as a man of mild and agreeable manners. He was open-hearted and he was very generous. Another person, this was Eber's cousin, described him as selfish, largely devoid of a conscience. He was tyrannical, vindictive, and aggressive. And he was involved with illegitimate and dishonest schemes. How could this be? Uh, we've got these completely... Uh, opposite interpretations of his life. Well, maybe, I'll come back to this at the end of the presentation, maybe uh, in the back of your mind, you could be thinking about this and trying to determine which of those quotations uh, you think best embodies the actions and, and uh, the life of Eber Brock Ward. So, um, Ward himself uh, was born in 1811. He was actually born in Canada. Uh, he, he was born to parents who were Americans. Um, his parents grew up in Vermont and his, his, his mom and dad moved around a lot when Eber was really young, uh, largely because uh, Eber's dad was not interested in farming. And so he engaged in a variety of industries. Uh, so he was born in, on Christmas day uh, in 1811, just prior to the war of 1812. Well, because of the conflict between the United States and the British, um, they moved back to the United States when Eber was very young. When Eber was six years old, the family decided that they would move from the New England states to Kentucky. While they were on the way to Kentucky, uh, tragedy struck the family. Eber's mother died on the way and Eber was only six years old. She, she actually died on um, Eber's sister's ninth birthday. Uh, that was Emily Ward, whom I'll talk about a little bit later. So this was really tragic for the family. Eber's father wasn't exactly sure uh, where, where they should go. Um, he decided that they would not continue the, the journey to Kentucky, but he had a brother who lived in Marine City. And so that's where the family ended up. One thing that I would like to point out, because I have this image of Eber's father here, whose name was also Eber Ward. Um, Eber's father 
uh, spent some time in Kentucky. That's why he was interested in, in moving there permanently. Uh, and he loved it there. He thought it was a great place for opportunity for economic advancement. But he was very anti-slavery. Uh, he described the slaveholders in Kentucky as guilty as blasphemy and that they were hip hypocrites. Eber's father's ideas about slavery would actually influence Eber uh, later in life. Uh, if you're not familiar with Marine City, um, the arrow is pointing here. So it's on the east side of the state, north of Detroit, on the St. Clair River. Uh, and so this is where Eber spent his formative years. Uh, and for many years, Marine City was uh, originally known as Newport, uh, but uh, it was in the 1860s, I believe, that they changed the name to Marine City. In addition to his father, probably the most important person who shaped his early life uh, and his, his career uh, would be Eber's uncle Samuel. Um, Samuel Ward was a, a successful businessman in his own right. He owned uh, some steam, well, he owned uh, sailing vessels uh, and he was involved in shipping uh, throughout the Great Lakes. In fact, when the uh, Erie Canal was completed in the 1820s. He was the first person from the Great Lakes to gather a range of, of um, marketable goods uh, and to go east, excuse me, westward uh, through the Erie Canal all the way to New York City. And he delivered goods to New York. And then he gathered up um, other trade goods that he wanted to bring through uh, to the Great Lakes. So he was the first person to do that. Uh, and he had more than one sailing vessel uh, and he was really successful himself. Eber began working as what's called a cabin boy, uh, just kind of running errands and things like that for his uncle beginning at the age of 11. Uh, but then, um, and he would often do that on and off during the summers. But eventually, uh, when Eber was in his early 20s, he began working full time for his uncle uh, in 1832. He started off as his uncle's protege and eventually became his uncle's partner. Uh, the context of what was going on in Michigan at that time is, is really important. Both Eber and his uncle Samuel uh, were involved in the shipping industry uh, at a fortuitous time because Michigan experienced a great deal of population growth uh, in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s when, when they were both involved in the industry. And you can see those statistics there on the left. Um, when we think about westward expansion, the, the, the images that come to mind usually uh, involve the Oregon Trail, people on wagons, uh, maybe they were going to the gold fields of California, and there's nothing wrong with that. But not everyone went all the way to the West Coast. So a lot of people ended up in the Midwest, uh, or what was at that time called the Old Northwest. Um, and so um, Eber and his uncle shipped people eastward and westward. They shipped goods uh, and they developed one of the larger fleets of steam uh, um, sailing vessels and then eventually steamboats uh, throughout the Great Lakes. Initially, Samuel Ward only had sailing vessels and he was really hesitant to try to invest in steamboats. But Eber probably encouraged his older uncle, who was a little bit more conservative, uh, to invest in the more expensive steamboats because that was really the future. Uh, and so on the right, you see an image here of the first steamboat that Eber and Samuel Ward had. That was the Huron, uh, and it was launched in 1839. On the left, you see an inventory of a number of vessels that were owned by Eber and his uncle. Uh, you can see the Champion in 1843, then the St. Louis in 1844. Several years in a row, they were able to use the proceeds from the Huron, which really pro provided a foundation uh, for their growing um, number of vessels. Um, in 1849, you see they actually were able to produce two uh, in 1851, three. So this was really a large, um, uh, you know, convoy. It would eventually become a, like a convoy of, of uh, different sailing uh, vessels and steamboats that Eber and his uncle had. Eber also did have a private life. Um, and the image here shows Eber with his wife, Polly. Uh, and this is possibly the oldest 
image taken uh, uh, from the state of Michigan, uh, and this is in um, this is from about 1842, uh, and this is actually housed at the uh, Clements Library at the University of Michigan. Eber and Polly married when, in 1837. Polly was Polly and Eber were cousins, uh, but they weren't related by blood. So I'll try to explain this. So they grew up together and they knew each other from an early age. Samuel Ward was Eber's uncle. Samuel's wife was named Elizabeth. Elizabeth had a sister who had some children. And it turns out that Elizabeth Ward's sister and her husband died. And so after um, um, mom and dad died, uh, Elizabeth Ward and Samuel Ward took their nieces, they were all three girls, and they raised them as if they were their own. And so um, Eber and Polly were cousins, but they were not related by blood. And I guess since they got married, we could say that they were, do I dare say, kissing cousins. Uh, so anyway, with that, um, they would be married for about uh, 30 years, a little over 30 years, and they would have eight children uh, and uh, seven would reach adulthood. If you look closely at the images here, uh, we see Eber um, and he's holding a book. He's very serious and he's got an image of a steamboat. Basically, he's exuding confidence and he's like, hey, I'm I'm a businessman and I'm involved in the shipping industry. And um uh, and given some other uh, of his traits that I'll talk about a little bit later, maybe it's like, you, you don't want to mess with me uh, because I'm, I'm going to be a really top-notch businessman. On the right, we see Polly, uh, who's got an infant uh, in her lap. The, and she's representing really the true, oh, I guess you could say um, uh, uh, the image expected of women, uh, the true motherhood or womanhood uh, from that time period. Um, so. By the 1840s and 1850s, Eber and his uncle had one of the largest fleets of vessels on the Great Lakes. And it wasn't just that they had a lot of different ships. Um, I'm going to try something here, and I hope this works. Hopefully, you can see this. It says E.B. Ward's Warehouse, okay, uh, right there. Not only did Eber and his uncle have ships so that they could transport people and goods, they, you know, if you think about Amazon uh, these days, having a warehouse someplace where some highways come together, or maybe Meyer or Walmart or something like that, Eber and his uncle had these warehouses where they would keep all sorts of goods that could be transported throughout the Great Lakes or um, uh, um, from, from one spot to another. And they were providing the transportation for those goods, but also the goods themselves. So they were doing a very brisk business that was very successful. You could see some of the numbers associated with this success uh, here, just one second. Um, I forgot to mention uh, that uh, Eber and Samuel were partners, but then Samuel died in 1854 and he uh, left the bulk of his estate to, to Eber. Samuel did have a son, but his son was disabled um, uh, and he was never able to, and he was, um, he didn't have the mental capacity to take over the business. So in many ways, Eber became the son that Samuel never had. Uh, and so that's why he ended up um, giving Eber the bulk of his estate uh, in his will. Any research uh, dealing with Eber Ward uh, really needs to begin at the Burton Historical um, uh, Society, or at, at the Burton, I should say, uh, the collection which is in the Detroit Public uh, Library. Um, there are there's correspondence, there's ledger books, and things like that. And so the images here show the the joint holdings, the the, the value of the holdings that Eber and his uncle had in the early 1850s. Um, and as you can see they were worth over half a million dollars. Uh, and if you were to translate that to more modern numbers, um, we've got 17 million. And so Eber ended up inheriting the bulk of this. Uh, and so he was very wealthy, but he didn't just stop with the shipping industry. 
One of the traits that we're going to see about Eber Ward is that he was interested in diversifying his business empire uh, into many different industries. In 1853, even before Samuel Ward died, uh, he founded the Eureka Iron Company just outside of Detroit in Wyandotte. And uh, um, in the years immediately before and after the Civil War, the railroad industry was arguably the uh, most important industry in the United States. Well, if you're going to have railroads, uh, that takes a lot of iron and steel. Uh, and so Eber found, founds, he's the lead person, he founds the um, Eureka Iron Company, and they produce all sorts of things like iron rails, spikes, boiler plates, different things like that. On the eve of the Civil War, it's the largest factory in the state. Shortly after the Civil War, he's got 400 employees there with a very large payroll every single month. But he didn't stop there. He also saw that the 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 um, Eureka Iron Company was so successful that he ended up investing in two other iron and steel operations. The most important uh, was the North Chicago Rolling Mill, uh, and this was founded in 1857, just a couple of years, just a few years uh, after the Eureka Iron Company. He had to invest over two hundred thousand dollars initially, and that particular facility always had the latest technology. He was continually upgrading things. There was a fire in the 1850, uh, or excuse me, in the 18, there was a fire. Um, and uh, he ended up having to start from scratch. Uh, and they use always use the most um, important pieces of technology. Uh, he had over 500 employees. And those 500 employees uh, supported many, many families in the Chicago area. He also had a, a company in, in Milwaukee. This one started after the Civil War, and you see some images associated with those right here. So by 1850 or so, Eber moved from Marine City to Detroit, but he wasn't just a Michigan figure. He had the operations in Wyandotte, where the, um, the arrow is just south of Detroit. He had the operations in Chicago, as well as in Milwaukee. This prompted the Chicago Tribune to label Eber Ward the Iron King of the West uh, as early as 1873. And so he was recognized as this major player and an important figure, not just from Michigan, but throughout the Great Lakes. But he didn't stop there. Oh, I take that back. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. I'm sorry. Um, uh, he, he was this uh, Iron King, uh, but pro arguably his greatest triumph uh, was the fact that he always invested in the latest technologies, and this included the Bessemer method of producing steel. Iron rails on the railroad tracks uh, could last maybe two, three years, something along those lines, and then they had to be replaced. Steel, which originally had to be imported from England, steel rails could go for 10 years or more. Um, the Bessemer method of producing steel was perfected by Sir Henry Bessemer, who was from England, uh, and Ward was the first in the United States to start using that Bessemer method to, to not just produce iron, but also to produce steel, which was much stronger, much more durable, and better uh, for those iron, uh, particularly for the, for the um, railroad tracks. But Ward was a tough guy to work for. <laughs> Um, he always wanted to keep his wages as low as possible. He was always trying to cut costs, uh, and the most important cost or the biggest cost usually was labor. Uh, and he also tried to control aspects of his employees' lives. So uh, he had company housing, and if you were caught with alcohol in the company housing, not only did you lose your job, you lost your house. Uh, and so he was a hard person to work for. Uh, and he was very anti-union, which was not unique uh, among business leaders in this era or even, you know, uh, moving on in, in the next few decades. Uh, but he described unions as wrong and tyrannical. And he said, you know, maybe they might do some things uh, in, in terms of uh, producing um, some uh, better conditions and working conditions, but he never wanted to uh, cave in to any of the demands of unions, particularly when it came to compensation uh, or wages. Now, this is what I meant to say. 
but he didn't stop there. Okay, so he's involved in the shipping industry. He was involved in iron and steel production, but he also was engaged in the railroad industry. He was an early investor in the Detroit and Milwaukee Railway, but arguably the most important railroad for him was the Flint and Pier Marquette. He served as president of the Flint and Pier Marquette um, from beginning in 1860 until he died in 1875. And the Flint and Pear Marquette started in Monroe, Michigan uh, uh, here, and it ended up going westward and, and went across to what is now Ludington. Uh, originally, the city of Ludington was named Pier Marquette, so that's why it was, it was the, uh, the Flint and Pear Marquette Railway. This was a land-grant railroad. For, and so in order to encourage companies to invest in railroad construction, because the government saw uh, that railroads would help with the economy of the, the country and bring the country closer together. So they wanted to encourage people to invest in the railroads, and they were really expensive. So they gave away free land um, to the railroad companies. For every mile of track that the Flint and Pier Marquette constructed, they would receive six square miles of land. That's what that land grant railroad meant. Just to let you know, uh, when the Transcontinental Railroad was being constructed in the United States in the years after the Civil War, for every mile of track that was built, the railroad companies received 20 square miles of land. So that was uh, uh, designed at that time in order to encourage this investment. These days, uh, as a generality, if, a, if a, a city or a municipality wanted to encourage a business to move into the area, they would probably offer uh, some sort of a tax break. Um, back in the 19th century in particular, there was a lot of land that the government owned, and so that was the gift, so to speak, to encourage businesses to uh, invest. But Ward didn't stop there with the railroad industry. He also was involved in the lumber industry. Now, the image here shows James Ludington, who was an important lumber baron in what is now the city of Ludington. Eber Ward owned several thousand acres of land along the river that fed into the city of Ludington, the Pier Marquette River. Ward owned that property, and there were lots of timbered property, lots of trees on that, but it wasn't useful uh, until he could get a spot for a sawmill. Well, James Ludington owned the property where uh, uh, the sawmill uh, should, would be located. And um, he was not interested in selling any of that property to Eber Ward. He wanted to be the main lumber baron in the Ludington area. Well, uh, uh, they negotiated back and forth actually for several months and it turned into a couple of years. And Ward had had enough. When James Ludington's lumber crew trespassed on Eber Ward's timbered property, land that Eber Ward owned. Some of James Ludington's crew went onto Eber Ward's land, cut down some of those trees. They trespassed and Eber Ward heard about it. He's like, ah, I've got him now. He didn't do anything initially. But once Ludington came to Detroit, which was Eber Ward City, Ludington had, or excuse me, James, uh, Eber Ward had Ludington thrown in jail uh, and Ward, you know, went to him and he said, well, um, are you ready to sell me that property now? Uh, and suddenly James Ludington was willing to sell this property to Eber Ward and Ward became the region's largest producer of finished lumber. What we see is that Eber Ward was willing to throw, get, to throw one of his business rivals in jail to intimidate him into selling him property that he wanted to purchase. Here we see some images of some of the lumber um, uh, operations that Eber Ward had in the Lunnington area. Uh, he had two major sawmills, and once those were starting in operation, he was the largest producer of lumber uh, there in that community. But he didn't stop there. And he was involved in uh, Leelanau County, uh, and he ended up purchasing the 
Leland Lake Superior Iron Company. Uh, and there's a lot of materials uh, at the Leland Ah Historical Society, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, uh, and it's a great place to do research. There's lots of images, lots of um, uh, like the one that's shown here. Uh, and so I would encourage people, if you're interested in more detail, uh, to talk to some of the people there and, and maybe do some research on your, on your own, because there are a lot of great materials there. So Ward wanted to be as efficient as possible uh, in his operations. That's why he purchased the Leland Lake Superior Iron Company in 1872. There's a great history of the Leland Ironworks uh, in the archives at the Leland Historical Society. You see that, um, that pamphlet that's a recreation uh, of some newspaper articles from that had previously been published. It's a really nice publication. Um, I, I thought it was great. Uh, and you may find the uh, rock uh, shown on the bottom there uh, as something that's familiar near the waterfront. Uh, and there's a plaque on that rock that uh, identifies the site of the Leland um, uh, you know, the Leland um, Iron Company uh, and that. And so uh, that, that Ward ended up purchasing. And so that was right down where the, the area where the marina and the waterfront is today. So why do you do this? Well, Leland was about 80 miles from Escanaba. The UP, Michigan's UP, had a lot of iron ore and Escanaba was a deep uh, had a really had a deep port and it was really an excellent port for exporting all of that iron ore to different iron and steel companies throughout the Great Lakes. Ward uh, wanted to buy this company because he wanted to produce pig iron uh, in Leland. And so pig iron would then be, well, iron ore would be transported to Leland. It would then be transformed into pig iron. And then that pig iron could then be shipped to, to Ward's facilities, whether it was in Wyandotte, Chicago, or Milwaukee. It was another way to develop efficiencies within his whole process. And Ward continued to operate um, in, in the area until his death in 1875. And, the, the, and there were operations in the area of Leland uh, until, what, about 1884, 1885, if I remember correctly. It, it lasted for roughly about 10 years. It started and stopped um, um, for about just about 10 years after Ward's death. But, but after 1885, I'm pretty sure that that's when it ended. So how could he be so successful? How was, how was he, you know, what was the secret to what he was doing? Ward engaged in vertical integration. He owned iron mines where the iron ore was dug out of the ground. He owned the vessels to transport that iron ore to his iron and steel uh, uh, facilities throughout the Great Lakes. He then owned the, or he was the president of the railroads and a major investor in other railroads that purchased those products that were produced at his iron and steel mills. When you think about the lumber industry, he owned timbered property. He owned the sawmills. He owned the vessels that transported the finished lumber, like the two by fours uh, from, from uh, whether it was his facility in Lettington. He also had large um, sawmills in um, parts of Ohio that was uh, transported to different markets throughout the Great Lakes. He also had the railroads to transport some of that lumber as well. So his successful employment of vertical integration uh, was really one of the major secrets to his success. And he did this well before Andrew Carnegie, who's often um, seen or identified as the person who uh, really perfected this uh, with the steel industry. So what about other aspects of Ward's life uh, and, his, and his family? The image here shows Emily Ward, uh, probably the closest and most important relationship that Eber had uh, with anyone throughout his entire life was with his sister, Emily. Uh, Emily's mom died on her ninth birthday, and in many ways, Emily took over the role uh, that their mother had um, uh, for, for Eber and his siblings. Emily never married. She, she grew up very quickly, you know, after her mother's death. Um, and she was affectionately known by members of the family, as well as people in the community of, of, in Detroit, as Aunt Emily. She ended up caring for her nieces and nephews because Eber and Emily's, uh, Eber and Emily had two sisters. They both died young. Uh, and so Emily ended up raising those children. 
one of Emily's goals was to have a school for children. And she opened it and it was called Newport Academy in 1845. The building where these school activities took place or where the school was, uh, is actually still standing. And today uh, it is the Marine City Pride and Heritage Museum. This offered extended educational opportunities for students, uh, whether they were interested in foreign language or advanced studies like in the sciences. Um, and just as Eber was uh, someone who wanted to control all aspects of his businesses, um, Emily was similar uh, with the school. So Emily was not the teacher, but she hired the teacher. She served as principal. She served as curriculum director. She was a school board of one. And as one of um, the uh, one of their contemporaries said, um, she was a school board member of one. And if somebody had a complaint, she had original jurisdiction for that complaint, as well as appellate jurisdiction for that complaint. Um, so uh, uh, Emily was very involved with this. It did take extra money. And so where did she get the money from? Well, that was Eber. Uh, and so Eber was involved in philanthropy uh, with Newport Academy. Eber was also involved in politics. Originally, Eber was a Whig, uh, which was a political party common in the United States from the 1830s to the mid-1850s. But eventually, that uh, party largely evolved into the Republican Party uh, and the Republican Party of today. The issue, or one of the issues that really drove um, Eber to the Republican Party was its stance on, and opposition to the expansion of slavery. Uh, in the mid-1850s, the, the big issue that was beginning to and would eventually divide the country uh, was whether or not slavery would expand into areas of the American West, particularly regions that the United States acquired as a result of the Mexican War. People in Kansas were going to vote as to whether or not they wanted to have slavery legal or illegal. And eventually what happened is that a bunch of supporters of slavery and a bunch of opponents to, uh, of slavery rushed to Kansas to vote in this election and a mini civil war broke out. It was called Bleeding Kansas because there were deaths. Well, uh, a, an anti-slavery organization realized what was going on. And so they asked for volunteers and they asked for money to provide aid to Kansas. And you can kind of see that as the headline of the newspaper here from the Western Reserve Chronicle. You can also see one, one of the largest contrib contributors to this was Eber Ward. And he donated $10,000 to this anti-slavery crusade in Kansas. One of Eber's co-workers or one of his employees uh, eventually um, described him as a radical on the issue of slavery because he was so opposed to the expansion of slavery and he believed that slavery was immoral uh, and he was very much um, against uh, slavery. And during the Civil War, he was a strong supporter of the Union. Several of his vessels were linked to the Underground Railroad as runaway slaves would arrive to um, some port uh, cities uh, along the Great Lakes. If uh, Eber Ward told his employees that if a runaway slave ever comes, you should let them on, our, on the ship, do not charge them anything, uh, and hide them in, in a particular area. And once we get to Canada, you can then let them off and let them then go to their freedom. Uh, and he was very clear uh, with his employees that that's how they should treat runaway slaves. And the image on the left identifies the Forest Queen, which was one of the vessels that he owned um, that was known to be, quote unquote, friendly toward runaway slaves. The Burton at the Detroit Public Library includes a lot of the correspondence that Eber had. Often in January, he would write these really long reflective letters to members of his family. And I think the reason why it was in January, you know, maybe it was partly kind of like a, um, uh, you know, a, uh, a New Year's resolution maybe, or he was reflecting at that time. But probably um, things would slow down at that time of the year. I mean, the vessels could not go through the Great Lakes. There's too much ice. And so he, he would, you know, very often write these, these messages to people. Uh, and one of the themes early on in his life 
uh, was that he would write things like, you know, money doesn't buy you happiness. And he was really critical of some people who were flaunting their wealth in the early 1850s in kind of in the Im immediate aftermath of the gold rush. And in fact, he was highly critical of a woman uh, who had these diamonds and she had these furs. And he made a comment in one of his letters where he said, well, gosh, I wonder how many people could have been housed and how many people could have been fed uh, with the riches that she was just flaunting and she didn't really need. That's what he wrote particularly in the early 1850s. Yet at the same time, he was being contradictory because he was working day after day. Do I dare say, you know, 24-7, 365, it seemed like, um, tirelessly to try to build this huge empire uh, for his family. The image on the right shows the, the mansion that he ultimately lived in in the Detroit area. Uh, so he was writing things early on in life about how, you know, you, money doesn't buy you happiness yet. Uh, over time, I think he, you know, um, uh, as I say here, succumbed to the excesses of the Gilded Age uh, and the time period in which he was living. One of Ward's friends described his family life as, quote, unsatisfactory, uh, so that um, his first marriage with Polly um, lasted for 30 years, but it ended in divorce uh, in 1869. Um, Eber uh, and Polly had eight children, seven uh, lived to to become adults, but he was often just an absent father. He was just working, working, working. Um, and so Eber and Polly divorced in 1869. Uh, in less than six months, uh, Polly passed away. So she died. Um, about a month after the divorce was final, Eber remarried. So he was having an affair uh, prior to the end of, of his marriage. And he married Catherine Lyon Ward. Uh, she came from a family from Ohio and uh, was a prominent, fairly prominent family. Um, uh, and she was 30 years younger than Eber. Uh, so really, um, these days, uh, a person might uh, describe this situation um, and say that Eber was looking for a, quote, trophy wife. I don't think that phrase was used at that time. Uh, however, um, it's an example of this first failed marriage. And then he marries someone who's 30 years younger than him. Eber and Polly had seven children who reached adulthood okay, in his first marriage. Um, Eber and Catherine, his second wife, would have two children. In 1869, the same year that Eber remarried, he suffered a stroke. He had been working hour after hour, day after day, um, and he suffered a stroke, and he was 58 years old at the time. Uh, within a month, he was pretty much back to his old self, uh, and he was back working really hard, working long hours. Uh, his recovery was, was pretty quick. In 1873, just a couple of years later, the United States suffered what was called the Panic of 1873. These days, if we have an economic problem, we might call it a recession. We might call it a financial crisis. Um, back in the 1800s, they, uh, an economic downturn uh, was often referred to as a panic. There was a panic in 1819, a panic in 1837, panic in 1857, and a worse one in the years after the Civil War, the Panic of 1873. Uh, if the railroad industry was the top industry in the United States in the 1870s, you know, these years after the Civil War, um, there, were, there were a lot of miles of railroad track that were being constructed. Uh, and as, but one of the factors that led to this panic, as one historian put it, there was too much there were too many railroad tracks searching for too much traffic. There was just a, a boom in railroad construction and it led to a bust because there just wasn't as much demand uh, for the railroad traffic. And so the railroad industry tanked. The steel industry and the iron industry that Eber was heavily uh, invested in also suffered because they lost one of their most important customers. This added a lot of stress uh, to Eber as he was trying to juggle his, his various uh, business um, interests, and eventually he would suffer a second stroke in January of 1875. And he died 
at the age of 63. So the richest man in Michigan has died. He was 63 years old. He had a huge estate. It, it was valued, it turns out that it was valued at over $5 million. Prior to the Panic of 1873, it probably would have been at least double that, but um, values of property like that uh, really dropped. Well, a huge legal fight turned out um, uh, and, and emerged between Catherine Eber's second wife and the children from Eber's first marriage. Uh, and the newspaper headline here on the left, I think helps to show the interest that this had throughout the whole country. So the trial took place in Detroit, but here the New York Times was reporting on it. And it wasn't just the New York Times, there were newspapers all over the country uh, that were reporting on this case. It was really a long trial. One of the things that came out about it was this accusation that Eber was of an unsound mind when he wrote his uh, his will, uh, and his his will gave the bulk of his estate to to um, uh, his second wife Clara, and his children said, "Wait a minute, Clara uh, has has been um, abusing her relationship with Ward. He was un of unsound mind, and uh, he was way too involved with spiritualism." Eber had attended a range of seances. He was doing so um, um, on and off over time. Uh, he attended some of them even before he met uh, his second wife. Spiritualism in the United States really became quite popular, and I would argue largely as a form of entertainment, but, but it was more than entertainment for some. Um, this kind of became a little bit of a rage in the 1850s, but in particular, after the large numbers of deaths um, after the Civil War, uh, it really became uh, interesting for people. There were seances at the White House uh, because um, uh, uh, Mary Todd Lincoln uh, had them there uh, after their son died. Um, Horace Greeley, an important newspaper writer um, uh, and journalist, he went to attended seances. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, attended seances. And so the fact that Eber was attending some of these was not unique, um, but uh, it, the, the attorneys painted him as someone who was of unsound mind because he was involved uh, with uh, so many of these spiritual activities. Eventually, Eber's heirs would settle out of court. Um, Eber's second wife would receive the timber properties in the Ludington area and not have to pay any of the debts. The, um, the rest of Eber's estate went to his kids, but they had a lot of debt. Uh, and it turns out, in the long run, Catherine Ward uh, really got the, the bulk of, of the value out of the estate. And once this was settled, well, she had plans for the money. Um, Catherine had a lot of money, but she wanted more prestige. And so Eber and Catherine had a daughter. Her name was Clara. She was only two years old when her father died. But as she was growing older, she got into her teen years. She attended a range of different um, finishing schools. And she was groomed to try to marry uh, someone who was a royal in Europe. See, the uh, this she was part of kind of a movement in the United States in the 1890s, late 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. These were called uh, dollar princesses. The Americans had the money as the Industrial Revolution created large fortunes for for um, uh, from certain families. Well, the Europeans may have had the title, but maybe they didn't have as much money. Well, that's exactly what happened for the royal family or the a, a, a royal family uh, in Belgium. In 1890, Clara, shortly before her 17th birthday, married a prince from Belgium. His name was Joseph. Uh, and it was a very popular match, very exciting uh, for people in Europe as well as in the United States. Everyone's like, wow, isn't this wonderful? Clara has found her prince. She's going to live in a castle, and that's shown here. Um, and it was this wonderful thing. And even people in Europe were really excited about her. She was beautiful. She uh, didn't give in to convention, and that was considered to be uh, uh, really kind of nice at the time, especially early on in their relationship. 
Clara reportedly provided a dowry of three hundred thousand uh, dollars to the royal to the Chimay's, uh, in order to upgrade the castle. Um, and so, but she then uh, was able to um, to adopt this title of princess uh, for her. For a couple of years, this marriage was fine, but then um, Clara was involved in a range of scandals, and uh, she ended up leaving her prince, and she ran off with a Hungarian violinist named Rigo, uh, and this just caused all sorts of scandal uh, throughout Europe and in the United States. I was lucky enough to travel to Belgium as part of my research. It was it was really exciting. It was really, really cool. My wife came with me uh, and we visited Chimay Castle and I was able to meet and to talk with the current princess. Her name was Elsabeth uh, and she was 92 years old at the time. And so here you see me speaking with her. And so I sat down and I and 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 I said to her, can you tell me a little bit about Princess Clara, what 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 do you think about her? And she looked at me. She didn't say anything for a minute. And she said, "Well, we don't talk about her. Well, we didn't like her." Uh, and I was like, "Well, okay, all right." Uh, and then she said, "She was very pretty, but she was fast." And I was thinking to myself, "Well, what does she mean by fast? Um, does she mean that she was involved in?" Uh, affairs and sex scandals, and it turns out, yes. So this only made me want to do more research. Clara uh, was a little bit short on money after this marriage uh, and after she left uh, the prince. And so she sold her image to sell a range of items. She sold bicycles. The image here on the left is for cigarettes. Um, in the middle portion here, this is a postcard, and she would do a range of different um, performances, and she would do these performances while Rigo, her husband, is shown here, uh, would play the violin sometimes, uh, and she would wear a bodysuit that simulated nudity. Uh, some people, uh, some modern day historians have compared her to Paris Hilton uh, and some of the scandals that she was associated with. And they've called Clara the paparazzi princess uh, from the 19th century. Uh, so the marriage, again, you know, we're talking about 1890s, early 1900s. Uh, the press also had a field day with her. Uh, on the right, we see a headline from a local newspaper saying, here, she's gone with a gypsy. She's ruined her life. Uh, but the tabloids just couldn't get enough uh, as people were looking for all sorts of stories about Clara. Well, Clara's the daughter. What about Eber? Okay. Um, in many ways, you know, the title of this book is The Forgotten Iron King of the Great Lakes. Eber's legacy was forgotten almost like that. Why? Well, he had harsh business practices. And if he was ever in conflict with another business leader, he would do just about everything in order to crush opponents. And if you were an employee of Eber, maybe at times you might have a decent wage, but um, he wanted to control their lives and he was uh, involved in a lot of union conflicts. So, so there weren't as many friends as he might've had um, uh, among business associates. The impact of that trial also, uh, was significant. Ward was portrayed as kind of a kook, somebody who was crazy, and he was going to these seances all the time. And so he, it, this this um, uh, rhetoric uh, about him being a fool uh, caught on in some places. Also, there wasn't somebody in the family to take over the family business. And instead of his widow um, doing things to try to enhance her husband's legacy, there was a fight between Catherine and the children of Eber's first marriage. And so they were, rather than focusing on uh, Eber's legacy, they focused on this fight over the, war, over the, the money. And if there was any oxygen left in the room, uh, that was taken up by Clara and the scandals that she was associated with. If you ever make it to Detroit's Elmwood Cemetery, you could visit uh, Eber's uh, gravesite, and it's actually really nice. Um, uh, you can see, you know, the the the, the coffins that are there. Um, Eber is buried there. Samuel Ward, 
um, Emily Ward, Samuel Ward's um, uh, wife, and in fact, Eber's first wife is also buried there as well as some children. One other thing that I wanted to mention in terms of legal uh, Eber's legacy uh, would be that he didn't have any children that could take over uh, after his death. Uh, his one son that seemed to have, you know, decent business instincts, um, he was murdered uh, after being accused of raping a teen girl. Uh, at, after the first day of the trial, af after he was um, accused of raping this young woman, uh, the, the young woman's brother actually uh, stalked Eber's son, John, shot and killed him. Uh, and so uh, John couldn't, you know, he was dead. Um, some, uh, you know, in, insanity ran in the family, um, and there was some mental illness. So Henry ended up uh, in the Michigan State Hospital for the Insane. One child died in infancy. Another daughter um, had mental problems. Two of his sons were really skilled at spending their dad's money. That was Milton and Charles. Frederick died tragically um, of, a, of an overdose at the age of 19. And um, Eber, uh, Eber Jr., uh, uh, he wasn't able to take over any of, of the, um, the businesses. In fact, he was married, and then he made a comment to one of his uh, friends. He said, well, you know what? Uh, I probably should have uh, uh, married the, 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 my stepdaughter rather than my wife uh, because she was much more beautiful. Uh, and he ended up divorcing his wife, uh, and he ran off with uh, the maid. Uh, and, and I've already talked about Clara. So we're back to that painting and these quotations about Eber Ward. Was he more of a man who was mild and agreeable or was he selfish uh, and tyrannical and uh, devoid of a conscience? Well, maybe it's a little bit of both. <laughs> uh, really his actions um, with, in, in with the most important moral issue of the day, slavery, uh, demonstrated that he was open-hearted and generous. Yet he also uh, was engaged in all sorts of, of activities. I mean, having his business rival thrown in prison so that he could force him to do something that he wanted. I mean, wow. Um, that's just one example of some of his aggressiveness. So maybe it's a little bit of both. One more slide that I would like to show. Last December, I was able to actually see the Eber Ward portrait in person. It's a physically huge painting, 12 feet tall, maybe five feet wide. Um, it was awesome to be able to see this and to see in person and to be able to see close up how Eber dominated this canvas just as he dominated the business interests of, in the state of Michigan and in many ways throughout the, the Great Lakes during his lifetime. So. Uh, I'd like to say thank you so much uh, for uh, attending this presentation. I will stop sharing my screen and go here. And um, uh, if there are any questions uh, that people have, I would be happy to address those. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Michael. Yeah, please put your questions um, in the Q&A, and then I'll begin uh, with one of my own. What brought you on this journey of research? Um, what piqued your interest with? Sure, okay. So um, my first book was about Justice Stearns. Uh, he was a lumber baron in Michigan. And if you ever go to Ludington and you, uh, if you drive right into town, there's a big, huge beach that's called Stearns Beach. He was a lumber baron. Um, and uh, donated the property to the city. Well, Justice Stearns was Eber Ward's brother-in-law. And so no one had ever written a book about uh, Eber Ward. And Eber Ward was a much bigger figure than, than Justice Stearns. And so I started to investigate, um, is this possible? Where are the sources and things like that? And so uh, a friend of mine, as, as um, I talked with a friend uh, and, and I was looking at a couple of different options. And this is just the one that com was most compelling to me, especially all of the, the, the controversy associated with Clara uh, and the craziness associated with uh, Eber Ward's will and the fight over the will. 
Um, I have a second question too, that's kind of a, a little on the sidelines of this, but, and I don't know as much about railroad history, but you mentioned the railroads being, you know, granted all this land. I know some of them built, you know, hotels and things to attract tourism, but what else did they do with all that land? Oh, okay. So there's a few things that they could do. Um, a lot of it they sold and in order to get more capital uh, so that they could, um, uh, because it took so much cash uh, to invest in all the steel uh, and, and, and everything and to pay the laborers that they ended up um, selling most of that land and uh, in order to get more cash. That's the biggest thing that they did. And, and it, you know, it could be other things as well, but, but that's a biggie. So Leslie says, well done on the talk. Thank you. Did, did you have... Um... Did ever have any connections or spend time in Leelanau County, business or personal? So the, the Leland Ironworks, well, it was the, the E.B. E. Ward Company. That's the one that, that he operated uh, for, um, I guess it was only about three years and then he died. Uh, so that was the big one there. He did visit, but he never lived there. Uh, he was very much an absentee owner uh, for the businesses that he had outside of Detroit. Uh, he would visit his facility in Wyandotte, uh, and he also would, would spend time in Marine City, uh, even after he had moved from Marine City to uh, Detroit. But um, uh, he would spend a couple days here, and then go back to Detroit and then a couple days to another spot. Uh, but um, uh, so he did visit, but he never spent significant time there. It, it, yeah. So. Uh, the next question is, is there a connection with the shipwreck Eber Ward in the Straits of Mackinac named for the lighthouse keeper at Bois Blanc? So, um, all right. So one one thing I would say is that uh, Eber Ward's dad was the lighthouse keeper at Bois Blanc Island, and Eber spent two years with his father there. Uh, and and um, as Eber was growing up, uh, like in his um, well before he began working for for Samuel Ward. My understanding is that the shipwreck is named for Eber's cousin, whose name was also Eber Ward. Uh, so if you Google Eber Ward, um, uh, one of the first hits would be that shipwreck. And I was very confused, especially early on in some of my research. Uh, so his name is Eber Ward, um, or the shipwreck is, you know, the Eber Ward, uh, and it was named for a ship captain. Uh, but, but that was not this Eber. Uh, it was his cousin. Yeah, if anyone's um, curious a little bit more about that shipwreck and seeing some pictures of it, um, the local photographer, um, Chris Roxburgh, has taken some great photo. That's my understanding of, of the shipwreck in that. So that's, it's, you know, for, it's associated with Eber's cousin. So, yeah. Uh, someone asks, where is the large portrait located? Oh, that's at the Detroit Historical Society. And um, often they don't have it on display, but uh, I did a talk there. Um, uh, it was in December. And uh, and so they had it out for that. And it, it was, I just have to say, it was awesome uh, to actually be able to see it. Uh, and uh, I was really excited that they invited me to talk. And, and so, yeah, so that's where it's located. And sometimes they have it, uh, they may have it out periodically, but I don't think it's very often. Uh, and so it was really neat to see it last December. What happened to the 70,000 acres that Eber Ward owned near Ludington? Sure. Okay. So um, after Ward's death, his uh, wife, Clara, second wife, Clara, ended up inheriting that. And she actually operated those along with her brother and Justice Stearns, uh, the guy that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, she operated those for maybe about 20 years uh, and then uh, sold them. And initially, the, the U.S. economy was not doing well, uh, but then she made a ton of money on those. Uh, and now the area where those two... Um, facilities are located. There's um, an oxychemical uh, location there. So it's part of it is manufacturing still. And there, and it used to be Dow chemical. Uh, and then there's a, a condo uh, that's there right now too. So, yeah. Uh, Richard says, wasn't the Ward family heavily involved in shipbuilding also? Yes, they were. Um, and, and so uh, that was in the Detroit area uh, as, and in Marine City. Th there was a, a family in Marine City, uh, not the wards. Uh, well, I take that back. There were, it wasn't, 
there were members of the family uh, in Marine City uh, and associates of the family that did a lot of shipbuilding there. Uh, and then Eber also had investment in the Detroit area. Um, and then in Ohio's Black Swamp, uh, outside of Toledo, um, there was shipbuilding there as well. Uh, and in fact, one of his sons uh, oversaw the construction of um, a really beautiful uh, vessel. Uh, and so, yes, they were involved in shipbuilding as well. Uh, Leslie asks, what painter did this great portrait and why did Eber choose them? Oh, yeah. Okay. So the painter was John Mix Stanley. Uh, and Stanley was a very well-known um, artist. And he actually was famous for a lot of his portraits of the American West, uh, whether they were landscapes or Native Americans. Um, and so... Um, um, so he was a well-known artist and he was living in Detroit. Uh, he didn't live there his whole life, uh, but but um, I think he was maybe from the area. Then he was out west and then he came back. I'm not 100 percent sure about, you know, where he lived at times, but it was actually Emily uh, who commissioned that painting to be painted. And uh, this was a birthday present for Eber on his 60th birthday. Eber didn't know anything about it at all. Uh, and so, and, and, you know, Eber's birthday is, is Christmas Day. So Emily has a party on Christmas Day. Uh, and she's like, you know, Eber and, you know, came and, and he was at this party. And there were other people from the community who were there. And then at an appointed moment, uh, Emily opened the doors to uh, a particular room and ushered everyone in. And that's when Eber first saw the painting. And uh, according to some of the people who were there, they said um, this was one of the first times they had ever seen Eber show any emotion. Uh, I think he was brought to tears uh, because he was so surprised and touched by this, this wonderful portrait that had been painted. Uh, there's actually another. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, that's, that's a little story behind the painting. Um, there's another painting by the same uh, artist uh, and it's of Emily. Um, uh, when she's younger and she was involved in a, uh, oh, uh, a little bit of a, uh, not scandal, but she was, uh, she got stuck um, and, and had to, um, uh, um, found herself in, in kind of a life, uh, uh, you know, a threatening situation. And um, uh, this painter or this, you know, this artist painted a painting of Emily uh, um, as she was um, going, floating down uh, the St. Clair River. That's really cool. Uh, Leslie says, thank you. No surprise, his wife chose a prestigious artist. Yeah. Uh, John says, when E.B. Ward died, did he still hone his fleet of boats on the Great Lakes? And if so, what happened to the fleet? So uh, he owned several uh, uh, ships. Um, when he initially invested in the Eureka Iron Company, he he sold off some of his ships, uh, particularly those that were in the um, uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, he concentrated on um, the other Great Lakes and, and eventually uh, was more in the Eastern Great Lakes and also into Lake Superior. Uh, so, so he still had those at his death. Um, what ended up happening to his estate is that it just got split up. Uh, and so I don't know exactly what happened to some of his vessels, but I think that they were sold to, to, to one group and then another group and then another. Um, uh, and um, uh, so, so that's, you know, it just really dispersed. According to his will, he, his estate was supposed to be liquidated as quickly as possible. And that's what they did. That's another factor as to why um, a lot of people are un, uh, unfamiliar with Ward is that, I mean, his name disappeared uh, on bus the sides of, of businesses and things like that really quickly. I think you kind of answered John's next question, but what it was, does the EB Ward fortune continue to this day? Are there any descendants? There are descendants. Um, in fact, I was uh, doing a talk someplace and, and I mentioned that uh, I was going to be um, researching Eber Ward. And out of the blue, I got an email from one of Eber Ward's descendants who actually lives in Arizona. And they were wonderful. Uh, they shared images, they shared correspondence. Uh, they were really, really helpful. They were wonderful. Uh, and there are other Eber Ward descendants as well. Um, 
uh, that that some of which you know I um, I've had contact with, but but not a lot. Uh, there's one of uh, that traced the line through Clara, um, and he's living in New York. Uh, and so I had a little bit of correspondence with him, uh, but it was mainly the the um, the the Seitz family in um, Arizona. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Please go ahead and put those in the Q and A if you do. And then while we're waiting for any last questions, I um, I will show Michael's book here. And if you uh, live in the local area, you can pick up a copy at the Historical Society. And you're hearing my my daughter <laughs> making her little uh, voice cameo tonight. But thank you so much for being here with us. I've not seen any more questions. Thank you, Michael, for um, bringing to light this story and Eber's connection to Leelanau County and the ironworks. And um, I'll just mention, I wore my, my Leland blue for the locals who are watching tonight. <laughs> John says, this has been great. Thank you. I appreciate it. I think we all share that this evening. So thanks all everybody. Right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's when you spend a lot of time on a project, it's nice when people say, hey, we'd like to hear what you did. Uh, and that. So thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Have a good evening, everyone. Yep. All right.